All right, people, I want to get straight into what I have to speak to you about today. And uh, it comes out of, out of a series that we have been looking at. We did the book of Philippians, specifically focusing on the thing of joy, joy under every circumstance. Now we continue in the same environment, but uh, on a different train. I want to talk to you today about the persecuted church. Errol, thank you for mentioning that and setting the table for me today. And the beauty of the songs you've just sung kind of fit exactly with what I want to talk about. The persecuted church. In Hebrews chapter 13, one verse, it just says this. Verse 3. Remember. That means remember those in prison, as if you were their fellow prisoners. Use your imagination, people. Imagine you're a prisoner with these amazing people. And those who are mistreated, as if you yourselves were suffering. So I hope that you'll be able to cast your mind with me to that situation. It's difficult to imagine because I doubt any of us have ever been in that situation. But it's commanding us and suggesting we learn to remember those today who are in chains. Then I want to take you to our theme passage, which is the book of 2 Timothy, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 8, 11, and 12. This is what it says. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering. Now, that's a strange invitation. I don't mind joining you when you have a party or when you have a celebration, but the invitation is not to a party or celebration. The invitation here is to join him in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Then if you come down to verse 11, and of this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet I'm not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to safeguard that which I have committed to him against that, that day. I think it was maybe 18 months or so ago. I can't remember that we preached a, a sermon on the persecuted church. And I finished that sermon with the beginning of this sermon. I read to you the words of a martyr, a man in Zimbabwe, a pastor, who wouldn't shut up or give up or preach up, not preach up, he, he, was, he was just faithful to his call over there. People didn't like it. They put him in jail, he kept preaching. They beat him, he kept preaching. And then eventually they took his life from him. And I'm sure many of you have heard these words at least or maybe read them. That'd be great to frame them and stick them up in your house. But I want to read to you the bit that I ended with the last time we spoke about the martyrs. This is what it says. I'm a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. This was found in his Bible after he had been martyred. I am a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. We've just read about that in that passage. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his. And I won't look back. I won't let up. I won't slow down. I won't back away or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm done and finished with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, mundane talking, cheap living, and dwarfed goals. I am sick of that. That's what he's saying. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotion, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, or first, or tops, or recognized, or praised, or rewarded. I live by faith, lean on his presence, and I walk by patience, lifted by prayer and labor by Holy Spirit power. My face is set, my gaze is fast, my goal is heaven. 
My road may be narrow, my way rough, my companions few, but my guide is reliable and my mission is clear. I will not be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice or hesitate in the presence of the adversary. I will not negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, I won't shut up, or let up, until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, and preached up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must give until I drop, preach until all know, and work until he comes. And when he does come for his own, he'll have no problem recognizing me. My colors will be clear. Man, man, my colors will be clear. You know what that means? In any military unit, they generally have what they call their colors. And the colors are what they march behind. The colors are what they march into war standing with. They, they have this, this, these emblems that are typifying the, the qualities and the values that they have in their military unit. And what he's saying is when Jesus comes again, I'll be right there. He'll be looking for my banner and I will not be ashamed, not holding a banner or fighting under the wrong banner. My banner will be clear. My colors are out there for everyone to see. Now I look at this, and I say to myself, where do people like this come from? <laughs> where do people like this come from? You know, in the world in which we live, I don't know if you would agree, and I'm not being judgmental or critical, I'm just being truthful. You know, in, in the world in which we live, lukewarm is good enough. In the world in which we live, compromise a little bit, it's okay. It's okay, just, just remain relevant to the people around you. Be comfortable. Have comfortable living, and they will sacrifice the call for, for comfort. And we ask ourselves, where do these people come from who are willing to stand against everything else, to stand for this so that their colors are clear for the whole world to be able to see? This is who I am. This is how, oopsie, you knock over a bottle of water. <laughs> this is how, this is what my life stands for. My colors are very, very clear. Now, I look at that and I think, well, where do they come from? Are people like that just better people? You know, are they just born courageous and bold? And Are they just born like that? Do they have maybe a typical, particular type of, of DNA? How much did their background or their raising have? A, what parent involvement was involved in, in making people behave like this? Unashamed, bold, and uncompromising. Well, a little while back, I heard a, a, a story, of probably, I don't know if it's true or not, it's probably some kind of urban legend, of a kid who was on an airplane, he was traveling by himself, a young teenager, and they hit uh, rough weather, and the plane was bouncing all around the place, the plane was packed with people, and there was a breaking out of hysteria in the plane as it was dipping and diving all over the place. But this young man sat really still, he sat dead still with a smile on his face even, and he was not taking any notice of what was going on around him. They wondered how he could do it. And then they saw that he had earmuffs on with music playing in those things these kids wear today. And the music was blaring in his ear, and he was listening to this music, and the music that was in his mind and in his heart distracted him completely from the chamos that was going on around him. He was listening, in a, as it were, to another voice. When destruction happens around you, when devastation knocks at your door, when demons come and beat the heck out of you, when you feel like, people, turn that sound off by listening to another voice. Now as I look at these martyrs of yesteryear and the ones of even today, I wonder if they weren't listening to another voice. I think they were listening to the voice of the martyrs who had gone before. And the martyrs will always speak. The voice of the martyrs is what I would like to entitle today's sermon. And I really believe that the voice is a powerful one. If you just turn off all the other stuff and listen to their voice, it cries out to you. 
Now, the first martyr who ever lived was a guy by the name of, of, of Abel. Back at the Garden of Eden, Cain, his brother, was jealous that he killed Abel, and Abel became, in a sense, the first martyr of the world. And then when God came to Cain and said, So, Cain, where is your brother? He says, I'm not my brother's keeper. And he said, but why is it of interest to you? He says, because, God said, because uh, the cry of his blood is coming out to me. He's a martyr. This should not be. And his blood cries out to me. And all I can see and hear is the voice of this martyr. Even God hears that voice. So my prayer today, people, with everything inside of me, is I hope you hear the voice of the martyr speaking to you and into your life today. Interesting that uh, their voices are, are radical voices. And the greatest thing that we have to fight against is political correctness. I don't want to say anything's going to, going to kind of um, implicate my relationship with my friends. I don't want them to think bad of me. I, you know, I, I want to stay relevant. I want to stay cool. I want to stay in with the group. And, and God is saying, You'll never do that if you listen to the voice of the martyr. The voice of the martyr is radical. It's uncompromising and not at all politically correct. Jesus said that stage, didn't he? When Jesus came to the world and he spoke to the world and, and he was anything but compromising, he knew the truth, you see. But there's one thing that apparently all these martyrs have in common. And I will use the word weakness to, 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 you, to push aside the word meekness, which is probably a better word to describe Christianity. But weakness is something that they all had. They were vulnerable. Their lives were dependent upon somebody else. They had nothing to turn to other than God. And from the world's point of view, they were the weakest, weakest of all. Now the Romans and the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day had no time for weaknesses. They, 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 they liked strength. They wanted to talk about, let's make it strong. And here was this group of people, to all intents and purposes, looked weak. You know, they weren't really meek. They, they were meek. And you know what meekness is? is power under control. They had plenty of power, but it was all under control. But for this period of time, they portrayed themselves in the sense of incredible weakness. Now, we all elevate the strong, don't we? That's why we make movies about Spider-Man and Superman and Superwoman. You know, everybody's looking for a hero, and every hero out there is strong. But the heroes, as I find them here, are none of them are apparently strong outside of God helping them. They all appear to be weak. And yet God looks into their weakness, and he says, when you are weak, then you will be strong. And man, if that verse ever applied to anybody, it applied to these guys. Spurgeon himself, I love Spurgeon, great preacher of the 1800s, he said this, on the subject of boldness being a characteristic of Christian life. He said this. He says, Christianity has no place for a timid soul. Christianity, no place for a timid soul. If you were following our devotionals this last week, we, we dealt with the verse in, in, in the first chapter. It says, I have not given you a spirit of timidity, but I've given you a spirit of, of power and love and of a sound man and so good mind. And so God is saying, timidity should not be a characteristic of Christians. Boldness should be the characteristic. Now, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, it takes us to another level. It says, anyone who wants to live a godly life will surely be persecuted. Well, the one version says all. That means all, no exceptions. All who want to live a godly life are going to suffer persecution. But within this all, there are different categories. All is all. But there are different categories. There are those who suffer mildly and, and, and just circumstances of life just generally seem to go well for them. They don't understand what I'm talking about. But there are others that suffer mild persecution. Somebody says something ugly about you at the office. You get, you get isolated from a group of friends because of your following of Christ. That's all very mild. And Jesus told us to always expect that. It's different if you act badly. If you're arrogant and you're pompous, then you deserve the persecution you're getting. But if that is not the case, then everything along that line is stuff that you could deal with quite easily, I believe. But he goes to another category 
in Hebrews chapter 13, that talks about, and I've mentioned this before, it talks about the others, the others. Now, the others are an amazing group of people. You know, all are included in Hebrews 11, but the others fall into a completely different catchment. For those that want to read it, you can read Hebrews 11 for faith. In fact, that's what I'm wanting to go to, Hebrews 11. And you read all about the faith that helped them when persecution came. You read about Noah being able to continue his job when he was being persecuted. Abraham, he's, he suffered persecution because he wanted to kill his son. We see so many, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, all the great heroes of the faith that we say, man, they overrode their persecution. They drove straight through it. They had a battering ram that knocked down anybody who wanted to persecute them. And we go, rah, rah, big faith. But then all of a sudden we come to this other category here of others. And this is what it says about the others. The others were tortured. Tortured? I thought we got all our prayers answered. No, you're tortured. And then they refused to be released. They didn't take a way of escape. They refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging while still Others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheep's goats and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves, and they lived in holes in the ground. These are the others. But here's the worst thing. These were all commended by God for their faith. They never gave up, yet none of them received what they had been promised. Did that mean that God failed to give them the promise? Well, it would appear God didn't come through for you. We always know if that doesn't happen, there's another reason. But they never got what the others got. While the others were closing the mouths of lions, raising their loved ones from the dead, the others were hiding in caves, being sawed in two, being persecuted to the very end. Now, if those people could speak to us today, I wonder what their voices would say. Well, in my imagination, I've come up with a few things that I think the martyrs might want, might want to say to you today. The first, first one is I believe that the voice of the martyrs would say, be captivated and consumed by the example of Jesus. You've got to have a high example that you imitate, that you emulate, that you hold upside. I'm so glad John is saying, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and then what happens? Then the things of the earth will what? Go strangely dim. That's good, bad, and ugly. In the light of his glory and grace, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Be captivated by the example of Jesus. He's the only one, other than people who enter this world, people like the Apostle Paul, and even he would say, be careful. Jesus is the one who should captivate your thinking. We should be saying, how would Jesus handle this persecution? What should my attitude be? Should I change? Should I adapt? No, Jesus sets the pace. Be captivated by Jesus. Now, think about a stained glass window. Have you ever been to one of those big churches overseas, and you see uh, a stained glass window, and uh, very often Jesus is pictured as being kind of pale, hopeless looking, not adventurous. He's looked at as being so much of a, of a, of a person who is, is not confrontational, somebody who just will go with the flow. That's what Jesus is portrayed like on a stained glass window. Yeah, when I read the Bible, I don't see that at all. I just see Jesus out there confronting evil, confronting the fry scribes and the Pharisees, standing up for those who could not stand up for themselves that nobody wanted to be with. Jesus was a confrontationalist. Could I even say that he was revolutionary in his thinking? He didn't come by and compromise his ways of doing things. He didn't say, oh, okay, you've got a good idea. Well, if you just, let's meet you halfway. He never did that. He said, truth is truth and this is it. 
And he was so bold in his approach. And when we are captivated by that, when we are captivated and consumed by the example of Jesus, the person that we would put on our, on our stained glass window would be smiling. He'd be angry sometimes. He'd be someone who's boldness and fire in his eyes. And that's the Jesus that we have. But we painted a poor representation of him. Let me give you a good representation of the guy on the, on the, in the window. You know Lot, who was Abram's nephew? You know the story. He ended up in a place called Sodom. And uh, in Sodom, he played the popularity chart. He could see the depth of depravity, the sinfulness, the immoral ways of life, the unethical uh, thing that they were all doing. And yet he chose to find the middle path. So much so did he do it well that they liked him there. Here he was, the descendant of Abraham, someone who, should, who knew better, man. He knew better. And there he is sitting amongst the, the high-powered people in the town, compromised all over the place, and they liked the guy. Probably because he never spoke about hell. Probably, you know, that's politically incorrect. You don't want to talk about hell. How many of you did you hear a sermon about hell? People are going to tell you, listen carefully, there is a place called hell. Jesus told us that. And he wakes us up to the reality of take out the blinkers off your eyes and see the reality of the example of Jesus, what he held to be of high. So the second thing I would suggest is you be captivated by the reality of hell. There is such a place. It was created for devil and his demons. That's who it's created for. And I, I love the fact that God's grace is wonderful. And as we respond to it and repent, that we don't have to go to that awful place. William Booth. I don't know if you've heard of William Booth. He started that great movement uh, called the Salvation Army. William Booth was criticized by his critics. They said, so William, you're doing a job out there amongst all the poor, the alienated, those down in on, on Skid Row, those who are hanging around the prostitutes and the drunkards and the drunkards. William, what are you doing there? Well, why are you down there when you could be up in the towers and the highfalutin places of preaching and big churches? What, the, what on earth are you doing hanging out with those people? And I just love his answer. William Booth just simply said, he just simply said, he, he, he said, I want to build my church one meter from the gates of hell. So just before a guy goes in, he will see me standing there saying, you don't have to go in there. Come here. Follow Jesus. Give him your life. Repent. I want to be standing on the very brink of hell, still delivering the message to stop as many people from going in there as they possibly can. Don't you love that? That's bold. That's really bold. But if you want to put somebody on a stained glass mirror, please put Lot on there. Because Lot was just hopeless, compromising, giving up to everything. He would make a really cool picture on a stained glass window. He'd be looking like the Jesus that they've got up there. But that's not Jesus, is it? William Booth understood that. Thirdly, be captivated and consumed by the certainty of heaven. Certainty of heaven. As much as the reality of hell... Oh, my man, there is the certainty of this glorious place that Jesus has gone to prepare for us. And you can be certain of, of that. Glimpse of heaven is all you need. Is all you need to turn your life around. I like the story of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, where Stephen is one of the followers of Paul, and he's committed his life to Christ. And he, in the book of Acts, he preaches a sermon that nobody liked. In fact, they liked it so badly that they dragged this guy, Stephen, out of town, and everybody in the crowd picked up rocks and they wanted to stone him. And there Stephen, just, just apparently weak, but rather meek, he wasn't abusing his power, and he looked at these people and he said, Father, forgive them. Where did he get that from? He got that from Jesus, who hung upon a cross and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what to do. So he's imitating the example of Jesus right to the very end, is he? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. As the stones were railing down upon him and taking his life out of him, everyone as it hit, he lifts his eyes to heaven, and this is what it says in the passage. It says, he lifted his eyes to heaven, and he saw God. And then he saw Jesus standing at God's right hand. 
And you've got a picture of the glory of God and the beauty of heaven. And he looks at this and looks around him. He says, I don't want to look at this stuff. He's captivated by the glory of God and the beauty of this place that we call heaven. It's a wonderful thing to be like that. Let the glory of God and Jesus keep your focus. You know, amongst the martyrs, there's some incredible stories. You can apparently Google some of these things and read the legitimate stories of martyrs. Some people will maybe add a twist or two to it, but uh, there are some that are legitimate, very truthful. And I read one a, a while back that, that just left me broken as I read this thing. It was of a family and a father who had children, and they dragged them into the court, and they said to the father, you will deny Jesus. And he said, I'm sorry, I can't, can't do that. Your children will all deny Jesus, or else we're going to kill you all. And so the kid said, we can't do that either. My dad follows the example of Jesus, and we follow his example. I can't do that either. And so they took those five kids and they drove a steamroller over them and killed them. And the father's last words to, to his children was he said, guys, he said, guys, I'll see you on the other side. I'll see you on the other side. <sighs> and I don't know. He's listening to another voice. There's heaven on the other side. Maybe he could hear the angels already singing, welcoming his kids in there. And they killed him too. They drove over him apparently. And he met them on the other side. But while he was still on this side, he believed and was infatuated. He was captivated by the reality of this place called called heaven. Another thing the voice of the martyrs would tell you, don't be afraid of persecution because persecution is good for you <laughs> and God's glory. It's all about your good and God's glory right now. You say, what good could possibly come out of persecution? Let me tell you what good could come out of persecution. Go and have a look over in Russia, North Korea. It's the most persecuted country in the world right now. And you will see how good Christians are behaving there. They are united people. They don't split hairs over stupid little doctrines. They don't split hairs over, oh, well, we don't want this kind of song, or we want to sing that kind of song, or oh, my chair's not very comfortable. They don't split hairs about nothing, nothing. They are totally unified in the big things of the gospel about repentance and salvation and getting to heaven and doing good works and helping people. That's all they're interested in. They are united in cause. They're united in, in every aspect of it. Even though they may disagree, they are still united. The second thing it does, it purifies us. It purifies us. You know, the, the, I was at a kids' conference one, and, and the guy was trying to illustrate this. He said, hey, guys, if a whole bunch of army guys came in here with, with some machine guns, AK-47s, and said, okay, anybody who's, a, who's a, not a Christian here, you can get out. And you could leave. And the story would go that, yeah, many left. And then as those people who brought the guns in saw who was left, they knew they were left with the hard call. These are the real deals. They put their guns down. They said, okay, now we can have our prayer meeting. <laughs> That's a good story. You know, because it sorts out the men from the boys. And the men are people who are agents of God's glory. God is very possessive over his glory. But you know who his glory is in the main? It's you. So when you mess up and you don't do as you should be doing and living as a Christian, you're an embarrassment to the kingdom. God gets no glory out of the embarrassment out of your life. But when you start living like this, you've got God, God's attention and God's saying to Jesus, Jesus, look at those guys. Look at that Norwegian citizen church. Those people are bold. Those people are unafraid. They're uncompromising. They're not afraid of what could happen. Jesus, oh, those are our men. And they would applaud you. And it's for your good. You get the credit. Here's a better way to put it. You get credit in God's eyes for living like this. But when you get credit, man, God gets glory. And glory is much bigger 
than credit. So it's all about God's glory. Revelation 2, with this I'll finish. Revelation 2, there was one of the, the cities that, uh, that the angel, that Jesus came and he spoke to. Um, there were seven churches. The second church is a church called Smyrna. Smyrna. And it uh, was the second biggest city in the time. Very wealthy, lots of stuff in it. And uh, Smyrna had a, had a great revival. Thousands of people became believers in Paul's time. It was a going church. It was huge. And then persecution came to that church, and the Lord gave a letter to them, and the letter said something like this. It says, Smyrna, I have seen your toughness. I've seen your consistency. I've seen your desire to follow me no matter what the circumstances, no matter that they shout death at you, no matter that they... And I applaud you. This is what the letter is saying. But so you will soon be wiped out. And Smyrna today is just a ruin from where that beautiful church used to be. Not the church building, but the church people. Thousands of people in Smyrna were persecuted to death. They killed them all. That's what the devil does. First line of defense with the devil or attack of the devil is, is let's just wipe them out. He's tried to do that many times and failed every time. He has no original thinking in this. So when Christ's people rise and raise up and say, let's do something for, for, for God, then he or Satan will always come in and say, well, let's just kill him. Let's just wipe them out. And he fails every time because he unites the church. He purifies the church that ultimately becomes so much stronger they get credit and God gets glory. And Satan is the agent through which it happens. You know what Smyrna means? Smyrna means sweet smelling. You know where that comes from? The sacrificial system of the day where they would take incense and burn it at the altar of God. And apparently the smell of that incense would rise up and apparently would bless the nostrils of God. And then sometimes when they had sacrifices, they would put the sacrifice on the altar and burn it. And there was a lot of blood and there was a horrible stench. And so they would take a mixture of wine and water and they would pour it on the burning, smoking offering. And the combination of the smoke and the wine would bring up a beautiful smell into the nostrils of God. And God was pleased. People, there's nothing better than this, pleasing God. Let's stand more boldly. Let's stop compromising. Let's love people with everything we've got, even people that freak you out. Learn to love them. Learn to care at a far greater level. And watch what happens. I do have one more. Can I do it? Very quickly. <laughs> if the martyrs were here today and you would have asked them the question, was it worth it? What do you think they're going to say? Of course it was worth it. Of course. But you had your family taken and they were crushed. Was it worth it? Ah, absolutely worth it. I would do it again and again and again and again. If this is what it's all about, being a, a sweet smelling sacrifice offering to God, amen. Bring on the persecution. Job, your life was taken from you. you, you or your living was taken from you, your kids were taken from you. Job, how did you hold on to God and say, blessed is the name of the Lord, he's given, taken away. Job, how did you do that? He says, because my focus is not on this world, my focus is on eternity. And he would have heard the applause of God and God saying to the rest of the universe, to all the angels to say, check my man Job. He is faithful in all his ways. We're declaring him righteous. And he goes to heaven. Do you think all that pain that he suffered would ever be considered to be worth it? I think it was. I think, in fact, for goodness sake, that's nebulous. I know it was and it will be for us too. We need to pray. So what I'm gonna do is ask you today to do what we came to do according to that first verse. Let's remember those who are suffering persecution today. Let's put ourselves in that place where we can picture ourselves suffering alongside of them while we sit in this beautiful church. 
Nobody's going to shoot you when you leave here, people. But let's remember those who will be. And I'm going to invite you wherever you are, just for a couple of seconds. Don't you want to just bring the persecuted church to God in your prayer? And then I'll pray. Will you do that? That's cool. Let's pray. God, our Father, thank you for the example of those that have gone before. Thank you for the powerful testimony of the martyrs and how already they enjoy the benefit of being martyrs and those that are being martyred even today will enjoy the benefit of being with you. And one day, your scripture tells us, they, the martyrs, will rule for the millennium. You have a special place, a special place. We all get to go to that place if we come to Christ, but there's a special place in heaven reserved for those who have been martyred. God, we're not jealous of that. We're so, we're so happy for them that they get to spend eternity in so beautiful a place. Father, I pray today that as we look to you for our example of boldness, of tenacity, of not giving up, that we would emulate you to a greater extent. To those of us, Lord, who have lived a, a weak and a compromising Christian experience, an experience where anything goes, what the boys are doing, let me do that with them, and where the community's at, let me just do that. I want to be liked. I want to be relevant. Lord, if that's getting out of hand, please show us, man, that we need to repent and return to the real, real deal. If persecution comes, bring it on. It's okay. It's good for us. It unites us. It purifies us. I pray that be our portion today and in the days to come. Amen.